uh, so it's today is a busy day. So uh, <laughs> the two of us, <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. So we are glad to have uh, Emmanuel Diakonescu from Rutgers, who will speak about McKay correspondence and cohomological whole algebras. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Um, so this is with Mauro Porta and, and Francesco Sala. It's just a paper that was uh, uh, posted on the archive a couple of weeks ago. Um, so yeah, so what is the general setup uh, for this work? So it's basically the, set the setup of cohomological whole algebras, which I'm gonna briefly review in, in very broad terms. So one is given a, um, a C linear abelian category of homological dimension at most three. And the main assumptions are that the moduli stack of all objects of A, it's an algebraic stack. And also the uh, moduli stack of all exact sequences, three term exact sequences in A are, it's also an algebraic stack. I mean, in all natural, sort of, so to speak, natural abelian categories, this, these assumptions are immediately satisfied. So that's not something to be concerned about. Um, so the, then the general pattern is as follows. Uh, except of the first one, homological dimension doesn't have to be less. I was talking about the stack properties. Yeah, sure. The yeah. Homological dimension can be anything, but um, it's also easy to get examples in nature, so to speak. Um, and then the general pattern is as follows. And you have this natural uh, projections from the stack of complexes down to the um, stack of all objects. It can be projected in three ways by the initial object, by the middle object, and by the final object, um, counting from the left to, to the right. And then you're supposed you're given some kind of homology theory that can take, can take many incarnations, like it could be borel moore homology, it could be the uh, Chow group, uh, the algebraic cycles, um, K-theory, or a vanishing cycle homology, or maybe it's even some, something more exotic that I don't know about. Um, and then what you want to do is, is construct some kind of convolution algebra structure on the homology of, uh, on the homology of the moduli stack of objects by doing, by some, it's a standard construction of convolution. You just to take a first a, a pullback, which I'm gonna, ha in, well, it has to be for technical reasons, it will have to be a, a refined pullback. And then you take a, a push forward down to the middle. And that is expected, at least in many cases, to give you an associative algebra structure known under the name of cohomological whole algebra. Um, there are, of course, issues about these maps being well-defined. So um, first of all, you need Q, this map Q to be proper in order to have a well-defined push forward. And ideally, you would like this P1 cross P2 to be flat in order to have a, a well-defined pullback. That almost never happens, so you're going to have to, it has to, we have to resort to some more sophisticated techniques to define a refined pullback or a virtual pullback using various constructions, either um, virtual cycles or, or some kind of construction in some, in some uh, derived, uh, uh, for derived stacks or in the derived algebraic geometry. Um, but so that's the, the, that's the broad, very broad picture. So now what are the realizations? The first one that clearly started the subject is Kensevich and Soibermann, in which case A is homological dimension three and it's a Calabi L3 category. Um, and initially it was, um, uh, it's, it's a Calabi L3 category of representations of, of a Jacobi algebra or quiver with potential. Um, in that case, in order for this to work, um, H is going to be the vanishing cycle homology, or better said, the dual to the compactly supported cohomology of the, of the sheaf of vanishing cycles associated to this potential. It's a fairly sophisticated cohomological theory. Um, and but that it, it was shown by Konsevich and Soberman that in this case, you can construct the associative algebra structure, and that was called cohomological whole algebra. Um, and then, it, it, then there are many other constructions. Um, there is a construction of Schiffman and Vassero and also Young and Zhao um, for a billion categories of representations of pre-projective algebras associated to finite quivers. Um, many times these are called Nakajima quiver representations. And uh, in, this, in, each, in this case, A is Calabi L2. It's a Calabi L category of dimension two. Um, then, then there is another, there is, there is a lot of work on the subject. There is, 
the geometric setup. So when A is the, com uh, the is coherent sheaves on a smooth quasi-projective surface, we have the work of Schiffman Sala, Portain Sala, Kapranov, Vassero, and perhaps other references I don't, I'm, I'm missing right now. Um, and in this context, you can either take H to be Bogal morphology, or uh, perhaps case theory, or even a derived, there is even such a structure on derived categories, which was constructed by Porta and Sala using derived algebraic geometry. And they, cons they call this categorification of cohomological whole algebras. Um, anyway, so this is, these are the, this is kind of the setup that we're gonna, we're gonna, this talk is gonna be placed into. And um, before I actually specialize to the, to the current situation, uh, a, a few remarks, the three-dimensional Koha, the two-dimensional Koha constructions uh, for, for uh, pre-projective algebras actually um, are um, obtained as special cases of the three-dimensional Koha construction by dimensional reductions, a procedure called dimensional reduction. Um, and then um, this whole machinery is supposed to, this whole construction is supposed to be, in fact, uh, an incarnation of some much earlier construction of, of physical construction of the so-called algebra of BPS states um, by Harvey and Moore, which was done by Harvey and Moore in 96. Um, so then in some sense, this kind of prompted the whole, all this mathematical um, framework. Now, okay, so this is just in, broad, in very broad terms. And I, as you see, I, I didn't, I didn't uh, insist on technical details, at least not yet. Uh, so what is the current context? So the current context is, in some sense, it lies in between these two constructions, these two uh, different directions, in which we were trying to understand the connection, part of the, part of the motivation for this, the connection between the geometric koha of sheaves on surfaces and the uh, two-dimensional koha of uh, projective algebras. And we're gonna do that, of course, in a, in a special case. I mean, not for any surface or any pre-projective algebra, for a specific case of such objects which are re related by derived McKay correspondence. Um, that's part of the reason. Another, another motivation is to find explicit um, uh, presentations for cohomological whole algebra semi-stable objects. I'm gonna explain that a bit later once I, once I describe the setup. Um, so, so let's just, I'm gonna just briefly remind, I mean, just to set up notation and to, to make sure the, the setup is clear. So I'm gonna give you a very quick reminder of pre-projective algebra, which I'm gonna call capital Phi algebra of a quiver, of a finite quiver. Well, first of all, a finite quiver is just a collection of vertices and arrows, arrows stretching between the ver between vertices. And it can take any form, something like this. I mean, it's, it can be anything pretty much a priori. Um, anything like this, of course, any arrow has a tail and a head, or if you want a, a, a target and a source, consisting of vertices. Um, then what you do is, given such a diagram, or such a quiver, uh, you construct its double, which means that for each arrow A, you add an opposite arrow A star. So um, it's, you do something like this. If Q looks like here, like shown here, so suppose it's a diagram in this form, and if for each, whenever you see any arrow in the in Q, you add, you keep it, you preserve it, of course, but you add an a an, an opposite arrow. Um, so you double all the arrows in this way, and then um, in this bigger quiver, this double quiver, let's we have a, you, you, I mean, for any quiver, it's still a it's still a finite quiver, um, and you take its still linear path algebra, so the uh, algebra generated by by uh, um, um, pass in the, in, you know, uh, made of arrows of, of the quiver uh, where the product is concatenation of paths. So it's fairly straight, straightforward construction. And further now, we have now a natural uh, left-right ideal of relations sitting in this path algebra, which is basically to take some, in the appropriate sense, the commutator of A and A star, which means that for each vertex, I sum up over A, A star, where A ends, ends there, and then I, saw, I take the difference between, between A star A, where A starts there, and this, is, this generates a left-right ideal of relations. Um, and the pre-projective algebra associated to the original or initial quiver Q is just the quotient of the path algebra of the double by this ideal of relations. 
Now, for a very good reason, which I'm going to kind of suppress, these relations are many, many uh, are often called moment map relations because really what you're doing here is taking some sort of a uh, when you start, when you look at representations, you're taking really a holomorphic symplectic quotient. Uh, but in the abstract sense, you just do this algebraic construction. Um, so now this is the pre-projective algebra for any finite quiver Q. It has very interesting properties. And among the, the properties, one thing I think I forgot to write down explicitly, but um, is that in, in, with a very few exceptions, um, which can be dealt with, this is the, the if you want the, um, the billion category of representations of this pre-projective algebra is a Calabi auto category. It has, it has a serif functor, um, which shifts by two. Um, and that's very important in the construction of the associated cohomological whole algebra. Now, as I said, there are ex ex uh, ex exceptions. When fine, um, uh, funny enough, if you take Q to be the, uh, a finite thinking quiver, then the resulting pre-projective algebra has infinite homological dimension, but still there are tricks to deal with this situation and still get a cohomological whole algebra. Um, okay, so now what do we do? Well, um, well, I'm going to, uh, yeah, so in, in terms of notation, MQ will be the modulized stack of all finite dimensional representations of Q in vector spaces, complex vector spaces, the category of complex vector spaces. M pi Q will be now the same for the pre -project, the associated pre-projective algebra. And then what happens is that M pi Q turns out to be isomorphic to the total stack, if you want, of the cotangent bundle of MQ. And this is a symplectic stack. So that's the setup. You get you get some very, you get this kind of very symmetric picture this way. Now, of course, in this talk, you will not be just some random quiver. Um, that, would be diff it, that would be fairly uh, difficult. Um, but first of all, we are gonna sit, uh, situate ourselves in the context of McKay correspondence, which is a very, very old subject. Um, so we are gonna look at um, quivers associated to, to um, the canonical two-dimensional portion singularities. Um, and if you start from the quiver side, because that's how I started the presentation, that means that Q for me is going to be an affine thinking quiver of type A, type A. So it's gonna be a diagram that looks like this, have n vertices and arrows going like this circular around, for example, one to two, two to three, dot, 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 n, n minus one to n and back to one. And these are, this is my Q. This is my, my initial quiver Q. Um, then of course you have to run the whole machinery, do the double, then take the relations and do all that. And then you get a cohomological whole algebra. And there, this, this, there is a lot of work on this. There is a lot of work on finding explicit presentations. Um, actually I should say um, for this cohomological whole algebra, and um, it's based on Schiffman, Vassero, uh, Maulik and Okunko, Yang and Zhao. Um, and the, the, the end result is that the cohomological whole algebra of nilpotent representations of, of pi q is isomorphic to the positive part of an Youngian algebra, an affine Youngian. So the Youngian of affine SLN. Now I'm not gonna explicitly, I can tell you why the Youngian is explicitly known. You can write genera the generating, uh, sorry, generators and relations are very explicit. Um, but I'm not gonna go through that because it's not really needed for the purpose of this talk. I want to notice that it's just some explicit deformation of the universal enveloping algebra of, of the Kasmudi algebra associated to Q. So it's a fairly involved construction and it was known for a very long time. It plays a very important role in representation theory and the really um, remarkable aspect is that it now it shows up in this context of COHAS, the cohomological whole algebras. So it's being, it's, isom it's identified with the category of nilpotent, sorry, to the core of nilpotent uh, representations of the uh, pre-projective algebra. Um, so that's one explicit result. Um, now you can take, you can take, uh, you can wonder what happens if Q is a finite quiver of type A as opposed to affine. So this time I just have a, a standard thinking diagram of type A, I don't go back here. I don't have a, 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 an arrow going back. And then again, the represent the cohort near potent representations is known again for pi q, and it's uh, is the positive part of another Youngian, but this is not the enough Youngian, it's just the standard finite Youngian. 
a vessel K plus one in this case. Um, so this again, it follows from the work of people I, I mentioned before, so Shimon Basero, Yao and Zhao, Maolik and Kukov, and also some older paper from earlier paper of uh, Varanyo, uh, which started in some sense, not directly Kohas, but, but indirectly representations of, of, of the cohomological Hall algebra uh, by Hecke operators. Anyway, so this is another result we should keep in mind because it's gonna come up later in the talk. So to summarize up to now, this is the context. I'm gonna look at this affine quivers. I mean, the finite one will show up too. And we have this cohomological whole algebras that are explicitly known. Um, now, what, one of the questions that we're gonna to try to address is what happens if I wanna look at cohomological whole algebra of semi-stable representations of fixed slope? And for me, this is, Part of the motivation for this comes from physics, because this is really uh, what a physicist would naturally do by looking at all, if you want in the language of Harvey and Moore, it would to look at all BPS states that have the same phase resp uh, with respect to the supersymmetry algebra. So they are mutually, mutually supersymmetric. Um, so this is actually um, um, a very natural thing to do in physics, and it's also very natural to do in mathematics because uh, semi-stability, uh, no, semi-stable representations have been studied for a very long time and play an important role in many aspects of representation theory in the work of Nakajima, for example, and, and so on. So, um, so one of the questions is to look at the cohomological whole algebra of semi-stable representations of, of, pre of the pre-projective algebra. Um, so now I want to briefly remind you for just in case you didn't, you, you, uh, for people who may not be familiar with this um, of the immediately, I mean, of, of, of the bat, is that um, by what I mean by stability here is, is the, is the, uh, it, the conditions, the stability condition defined by King, which basically um, depends on a stability parameter. In this case, is the, uh, it's, a, it's a collection of n rational numbers. And for each such collection, zeta of n rational numbers, n being the number of vertices of this quiver, um, and if, if R given a representation R with a graded vector space V1, V2, Vn, you define a slope which is given by sum of zeta i dimension of Vi the, 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 um, divided by the total dimension. That's the zeta slope. And then of course the, um, the uh, semi-stability condition is just the usual slope condition with respect to, to a proper sub-representations. So you want all, 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 all proper non-zero sub-representations to have a smaller or equal slope. And of course, for stability, you want strict. So now you have, you can rerun, you can, by uh, using this machinery, you can construct a homological whole algebra of semi-stable representations of fixed slope. And in particular, you can take the slope to be zero without any loss of generality, because you can always shift this parameter such that this, the uh, slope becomes zero. So what, what is known about this? Well, before our paper, basically nothing was known, or at least not known to us. And then we weren't aware of any results in the literature. And so that's what one of the motivations tried to find something, to learn something about this algebra, this cohomological whole algebras. Another was to, um, and it, uh, somehow they came together with this other question of trying to understand if there is a connection to, to, to geometric cohomological whole algebras through uh, derived Mackay correspondence. Okay, so that's a that's a sort of a more precise formulation of the of the motivating question for this. So talk. you consider all of them or just nilpotent? For now, it's all of them. Now, what's going to happen is that in most examples, I'm going to look at. I'm, yeah, I you should remind me. Um, they're going to be automatically nilpotent, and it's going to be clear why. But there are some of them that it's it's easier to think geometrically, and then you'll, it's clear what's important and what is not really important. So let, let's let's discuss geometry um, first, and then we can come back to this question. Um, so what is the underlying geometric framework for this uh, for Mackay correspondence? Well, as I said, this goes back for a long, long time ago, Mackay and, and other, and, and it was noticed back back then. Um, well, we are looking at. Uh, canonical two-dimensional quotient singularities of type A. So that's a singularity of the type x, y equals z to the n in, in C3. Um, and it has a canonical crepent resolution. 
which is quasi-projective Krepton geyser. It's a Y, it's a smooth quasi-projective surface, which has a natural projection to X um, in such a way that the exception of the visor on Y, it's a, it's a tree of rational curves, C1, C2, C3, up to Cn minus one, all of them being have, having self-intersection negative two. So all of them are uh, projective lines and they intersect transversely. Um, the exception of the visor is reduced. So it has no multiplicities in this case. I mean, the multiplicity is one for each of them. So this is the structure. You have all this exceptional divisor that collapses down to a, the singular point that lives at the origin in X. Okay, now in order to set up Makeko correspondence, I'm gonna need one more divisor on Y, which in this case, I can take it to be, I should say, before I forget, I should say that Y in fact has a natural toric presentation. So Y is a toric surface. It's a quasi-projective toric surface. Uh, it has a natural toric presentation. So exploiting the toric presentation, I can find the natural extra divisor, which is in this case, it's an affine line. It's not compact anymore. It does, it's an affine line. It's, a, it's, a, it's an affine line that intersects only the last um, exceptional curve a, a transversely at a point and it misses all the others. Um, okay, this is not quite, I mean, this is not, it's a natural choice, not quite canonical. You can form, reformulate this in various ways. If you want using relations in the Picard group, let's make this choice. It's, it's not a terrible thing to do. And, and then we construct a sequence of divisors, di, by some formula like this, they are linear combinations of the curves, including cn. Very importantly, I need to include this, uh, this affine line, um, with, which have a very striking property, according to Vandenberg, who was who, the first one who came up with this, is that if I take the sum of the line bundle, associated line bundles, so di, you get a tilting object in the derived category of y. By which me, I mean that um, if you take the derived endomorphism algebra of P, in fact, it, it reduces to just and P, right? Um, because P is, is, is um, yeah, so in this case, it, it's, it's R and, but in fact, it's and, and it's isomorphic to, um, it's isomorphic to this algebra, it's isomorphic to the pre-projective algebra of the affine um, Dink and Quiver. That's one result, and then, if you construct, if you look at the tilting functor defined by P, which is R home from P to whatever you have in dB of Y, you apply R home P to um, dB of Y, you get an equivalence of triangulated categories between dB of Y and dB of the pre-projective pre algebra. Um, and furthermore, you get also, uh, this, this gives you more than that. It gives you an equivalence of abelian categories between some category of perverse coherent sheaves on Y and the natural heart of the T structure in the, on the quiver side is just, just the abelian category of representations of pi q. And this was studied in many, many instances by Nagao and Nakajima, for example, in even more general terms, um, having to do with three-dimensional singularities. Um, you have a paper, Ishii and Uehara, with discussing stability conditions and so on, and the bridge and stability conditions and so on. So it's it's a well-studied object. Um, it's a well-studied object. So now let me say a few words about this perverse, the category of perverse sheaves, it, because it's actually very important. It's a very important object that makes the connect, provides the connection between, you know, the uh, geometric objects like sheaves and, and quiver representations. So what is the, so P of Y is this, it's a heart of a T structure on, on the derived category of, of Y. So it consists of objects of amplitude negative one and zero to zero. So it only has cohomology, so E has cohomology only in two degrees, negative one and zero. And then it, ha it has to satisfy extra conditions. So for example, written in terms of the um, direct, uh, of direct images with respect to the projection to the singular, singular to, the, to the singularity, the singular hypersurface. So it, they are written here. So Ri pi, pi lowest I apply to, to the negative one cohomology has to be zero outside i equals one. Um, again, ri pi low star of h zero of v is zero outside i equals zero. Um, and then furthermore, something like h zero of v cannot, there are no homes between h zero and e and any sheaf f that maps to zero, that whose, whose direct images are, whose di all direct images are zero. It's a, it's a fairly um, you know, technical conditions. These are, they also occur in the work of Bridgeland on, on, uh, on flops and the right categories. So it looks a slightly technical, but this is the natural category of, the natural T structure you have to look at if you want to understand the connection between geometry and quivers. 
Um, and if you also enforce a compact condition, compact yeah, support yeah, condition. Uh, this is the perverse shift. These are all coherent perverse shifts. Right? I always mean coherent. There is, for me, all shifts are coherent in this talk. I'm not talking about constructible shifts at all. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so all, all shifts are for me coherent. Um, yeah, I apologize. This is, yeah. I, um, so if you also enforce a compact support for the cohomology shifts, then you get an equivalence to the abelian category of finite dimensional representations of the pre projective algebra. Um, in principle, if you don't impose this compact support, then you get you could, you could get infinite, uh, infinitely, yes, sorry, infinite dimensional representations. Um, all right. So, what are the stability conditions? Well, um, the stability conditions. Well, on on since this since the since the compactly supported perverse shifts are are isomorphic to pi q modules. Here, we're going to just use King stability conditions, like which which I reviewed a bit earlier. So, I'm going to use King stability on this side. With respect to this King stability parameters, there is this zeta slope, and then I'm going to use the usual slope stability on on coherent shifts on Y with compact support defined by some polarization. So we pick up a polarization uh, omega of Y, rational polarization, omega I, so is the sum of omega I D I. I define the slope of any co compactly supported coherent shift. I should say that any compactly supported coherent shift on Y is at most one dimensional. And I'm gonna be specifically concerned with the one dimensional ones in this talk. So um, the slope is defined this way. And uh, then we have omega stability. We have omega, the standard stability condition on, on compactly supported shifts on one. Okay, so, um, so this is the context that we are discussing. So um, as I said, as I explained in the beginning, what we can do with this in this setup, we, we have a construction of cohomological whole algebra, uh, algebras for um, categories of, of semi-stable objects of fixed slope. That can be done using the, uh, the available machinery, and it can be done on the sheaf side as well as on the quiver side. But of course, a priori, it's not, any, it's not clear at all, it's not clear at all how they interact with each other, what is, if there is a connection between them, because the, all this is induced by a derived equivalence, so it's not clear at all that, for example, it maps semi-stable objects to semi-stable objects. This is a non-trivial statement in this context, because usually, as you see, you change the T-structure, you have a derived equivalence that changes the T-structure, so uh, the correspondence between semi-stable objects is a, a non-trivial question. And in fact, in this context, it can be proven. You can, this is the first step to establish a clear relation between semi-stable objects on both sides. So here, what I'm going to do from this point on, I'm, going, I'm not gonna keep repeating these conditions, but they are always assumed to be this, this is always assumed to be the case. I'm gonna have a connect, collection of N minus one positive rationals and another uh, another mu uh, another positive rational mu uh, which is going to be eventually the slope on the geometric side and we define stability conditions zeta one zeta n minus one comma one over mu minus the sum this is the type of stability condition i want to look at okay the choice of zeta one up to zeta n minus one is arbitrary the choice of mu is arbitrary as long as they are positive but then this king stability parameter is going to be defined this way so now what we can prove first is that the, this tilting factor and this is an equivalence of a billion categories between the omega slope, um, the, uh, the semi omega semi-stable sheaves on Y with slope mu, with compact support, and the uh, um, zeta semi-stable uh, quiver representations or modules of pi q of slope zero. Okay, so oh, I should, yeah, good. So, so I, I want to get yeah, just in that case that we forget this. I forgot to write it, but in that context, omega is given by zeta i d i. So these parameters, the Keller parameters for the for y are given by um, zeta i. So that's what that's how the connection is realized. Um, so that's one thing you need to prove. I'm not going to go through the details of the proof. It's it's not terribly hard, but it's detailed and it's you know it's a bit tedious requires some technical analysis on both sides. Um, um, and, and I want to point out though a, 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 a corollary, which is that, um, again, fixing all this data that I just fixed, when, a, a byproduct of the proof is that you get 
um, you learn that the, uh, the for fixed slope and omega, the set of isomorphism classes of stable objects, not semi-stable, but stable objects is finite. And, and it's moreover a subset of the positive roots of SLN. Okay, this is something that comes out of the, of the, all the technical stuff that we need to prove in, the, in, in order to get the equivalence. And it's, it's an important observation, which is gonna come up later. So what's the first, the first theorem, the first theorem of, of, of our first result is that this equivalence of abelian categories we just got, it gi gives an, an isomorphism of cohomological whole algebras. And this can be done, this can be proven, well, there are two approaches. I mean, since I personally don't really understand much al the right algebraic geometry, I cannot really use this machinery. Uh, what my approach would be to, you know, to start checking that, you know, you get isomorphisms of stacks, isomorphism of, isomorphisms of, of stacks of complexes, and then you can use some machinery of, of the geometric construction of Caprano von Vassero and, and some of their results, the results proven in their paper to actually prove this equivalence. But that requires some work. I mean, it, it's, okay. Now, my collaborators, um, uh, Mauro and Francesco, however, you know, they are experts in the right algebraic geometry, so they basically uh, use their own uh, for me, it looks like black magic machinery, and, and they decided that yes, it, it works. And it's basically, it comes from the fact that the tilting functor, in fact, gives you an, um, an, uh, an isomorphism, an equivalence of uh, DG enhanced categories. So you can define DG categories um, on, or DG, you, know, you can present, sort of, you can define DG categories using projected resolutions on both sides. And in fact, the tilting functor gives you an equivalence of DG uh, categories. And from there, by using this derived algebraic machinery, you conclude that everything is, matches nicely. I mean, the stacks and the product, the Koha product and so on. So this is a much higher level approach, but which I can't really describe in detail. Um, in fact, if, 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 if there is enough interest for this particular aspect of, the, of this work, I would suggest inviting one of them to, to speak because um, I, I couldn't do justice to the subject. Um, so, so that's the first result. You get that the, the, the two cohomological whole algebra for semi-stable objects of a fixed slope match. Now this is perhaps nice. I mean, okay, good. Then we know we have a connection between geometry and, and, and algebra and quivers and, and geometry. Um, in some sense, was expect for me it was expected as a physicist because uh, this is some something having to do with the amount of supersymmetry you have in the in, in the physical theory here. So this matching is not totally surprising from the physical point of view, but it's good to see it realized mathematically. But however, once this is done, the next question would be: Well, we have these two sides; they match. Now, can we find nevertheless the expri an explicit presentation of either side? I mean, that doesn't mean we know. We know what the algebra is on each side, on either side. And um, it turns out that yes, the answer to this is yes. And quite surprisingly, to me at least, it was that it's more efficient, it's, it's better to approach the problem from the geometric point of view. So we are gonna work with the uh, homological whole algebra of uh, semi-stable coherent sheaves at fixed slope on, on this resolution Y. Um, somehow it makes the analysis somewhat easier. Um, whereas if you try to, to do this analysis here, perhaps with 2020 hindsight, you could go back and re reformulate it in these terms. But initially, this looked a more uh, impenetrable to me at least. Um, so it's one of the situations where an equivalence is not just there for its sake, for its own sake, but it actually, you, it, you provide some mileage. Um, um, for, you get some mileage from it. Um, okay, so what are the, the, well, first of all, let me just formulate the, the main, the second main result. And um, then I'm gonna try to explain wh where this comes from. Um, so the second main result is that the, this cohomological whole algebra of, of semi-stable sheaves of fixed slope ends up being isomorphic to, to a product of, of, of um, product of positive parts of, of, finite, of, yang, of finite Yangians of, uh, associated to uh, uh, algebras of type SLK. So, um, so you get a, a structure, I'm gonna be more precise about this, but the, I want to just formulate the, to tell you can, the kind of structure you're gonna get. It's a product of a um, finite set of, of, sorry, it's a finite product of Y plus SLK plus one, where K 
take some certain values that are going to be clear from the construction. So, so you can represent, so this algebra breaks down into this in this way. And at this point, it would be very useful to remind ourselves that this positive part y plus of the Youngian of SL k plus one is in fact, as I mentioned before, it's isomorphic to the cohomological whole algebra of nil potent representations of the pre-projective algebra associated to the finite thinking quiver of type A with K nodes. So this is, this is the way the Youngian appears in this story. This is the way, this is the kind of, if you want, realization of the Youngian you should keep in mind in order to, to make this connection clear. Okay, so for me, um, yeah, this is, as I said, I'm not gonna go into the details of the actual writing, the, the, the explicit presentation of the Youngian, that will not come up in this, in this talk. Um, but, but that's where it's coming from. Okay, so, um, so let me just try to sketch the proof. So the main observation, as I said, we, from proving the first result, um, we had this, we made this uh, observation that a byproduct of the proof of, of proof of theorem one was that the set of isomorphism classes of stable objects is finite, given that you fix the, the polarization omega and you fix the slope mu. And um, it, it is isomorphic to a subset of the positive roots of SLN. So that's what makes this problem tractable. The fact the set is completely finite. Um, so why is it finite? In some sense, it's not, it's not hard to see. This is, a, this is an easy statement. Um, in some, it, the proof is easy. What hap well, I, I'm not gonna explain the proof because, um, but, the, um, but what happens, I mean, the, how, how does this correspondence, the correspondence come about? Well, you can, the, each uh, omega semi-stable sh um, uh, sheaf of slope mu must have a first chain class of the form, which is a, which is a sum of, these exceptional curves with multiplicity one, with, you know, starting with some index i and ending with j, with some index j. So we have out of the whole, you know, tree of exceptional curves, you, you select a subtree, which is connected like this, and determined by a pair ij, and churn one of v has to be ci plus all the way. So churn one, so the possible values of churn one of v are identified with positive roots of SLN. And it turns out that, this pair ij, and given that the slope is fixed, uniquely determines the isomorphic, isomorphism class of E. So indeed, the uh, set of isomorphism classes ends up being identified with some subset of the positive roots of SLN, you have finite stable objects. Now, of course, in order to study um, the cohomological whole algebra structure, the first thing you have to understand, the first thing you have to understand is if you want, what is the X table of these objects? Um, so this, the strategy should, should be kind of um, fairly clear by now. We know by the Jordan Holder theorem, we know that any semi-stable object has this filtration um, with, with stable quotients, stable successive quotients. And yeah, the filtration is not canonical, but we'll deal with that a bit later. Uh, but um, the first step in, trying to understand the, the, the uh, cohomological whole algebra structure is at least to work out the extension, the X table for the state stable objects. And what, again, using fairly elementary methods, what you can prove is that if you take a pair of stable objects, then all extensions group, groups between them are, are zero, unless the, the two, uh, the corresponding strings of exceptional curves are linked like shown here. So unless you see that the support, if you want the scheme theoretic support of the first sheaf, links with the scheme theoretic support of the second sheaf like this, in which sense that they only intersect in this transverse intersection point here, all the extensions vanish for any other position. Okay, or, we, or of course, if it's backwards, if you exchange blue and green, of course, it's, it's, they're also, um, they're also, they also linked. So this is a, a, an elementary fact, fairly elementary. Now, if they are linked, then what you learn is that the X1 between them is C, corresponding to that intersection point, no matter how, which way the, um, even it's invariant on the exchanging the two objects by certain duality, um, and all other XKs, XK vanish. Okay, so now this is the first observation. 
And that leads us to define chains. So what you want to, want to do is to take this set of uh, isomorphism class of a stable objects and divide them into chains. So you pick up maximal sequences of linked divisors, right? So you can partition this set of, of semi-stable of, of stable objects into chains, which are formed of sequences of linked, maximal sequences of linked divisors, like this. Um, so then, um, so that's that's the uh, that's the, the 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 structure. And now you have to keep in mind that two objects that belong to two objects that belong to different chains have completely zero are orthogonal to each other in the sense that all x are zero. And then using the Jordan Holder theorem, what you can show is that the moduli stack of all semi-stable objects of, of um, fixed slope breaks down into a product over, um, over chains, over some moduli stacks associated to the chains. And the moduli stack associated to one particular chain lab labeled alpha is the moduli stack of all uh, objects whose uh, Jordan Holder factors belong to that particular chain. Um, so it's a natural decomposition given, given the product decomposition, given the, the, uh, the structure we found. And it also, this, this decomposition also propagates the stacks of exceptional objects, okay, because of this orthogonality condition relative to, to, extent, to extensions. So we have this, this split, this decomposition. Um, and then you can check that, yes, it yields, it yields a, a, a product structure for cohomological whole algebra. But at this point, you get a product structure, though you still don't know what the factors are. I mean, yes, it, it splits as a product, that's fine. Um, each, each factor is associated to a particular chain, but what are these factors? This is where, this is the, the, where the work, um, you have to do more work to determine the factors. Um, so now what I'm going to do, I'm, so I'm gonna assume that I have a particular chain alpha, it doesn't matter which, some random chain of linked divisors. And I wanna understand what this moduli stack is, the associated moduli stack. So this is the moduli stack of semi-stable objects uh, with the property that all the Jordan Holder factors belong to this particular chain. And this is where you have to use some, uh, some, uh, some more um, uh, um, involved methods, some more uh, sophisticated methods. So now I'm gonna, since I, I have at least 10 minutes to talk about this. So um, we found very useful, that there is a result of uh, highly and plural, or perhaps Siele, I don't know, I think they're, they're German, I think. And which basically, um, it's a categorical result, which is a, a tilting kind of result. So let me just try to formulate the result. So what is, it is that you're given a chain like this. Remember, this is a chain of these divisors. Each divisor itself is reducible. It's broken in pieces. This is not how they formulated their theorem, but this is what follows by applying their theorem to this. Um, I should say that I should caution you that this is not quite how it's formulated in their paper, but in any case, it, it applies to this formula, it, it, to this setup. So you, you associate to this chain a collection of line bundles, the formulas are right here, are, are not very, um, well, I mean, the formulas are important, but anyway, you associate a collection of line bundles with the property that it's really an exceptional sequence of line bundles. And then you take the smallest triangulated subcategories spanned by all these line bundles inside DB of Y. In fact, it's better for this to, to, for, to formulate this property to, to take a projective completion of DB of, of Y in, in this construction. I'm gonna kind of sweep this under the, uh, the, the rug. So if it's better to imagine that I, I took a projective completion, a smooth projective completion of Y in this. Um, and then what they proved is that given this exceptional collection of line bundles and the, the, the triangulated category they span, um, they found an explicit, presentation for this algebra, for this subcategory, for this uh, triangulated category, uh, is, uh, which is identified to the derived right category of some associative modules over some associative algebra using a tilting object. Now I should warn you that the tilting object here is not a, just a direct sum of line bundles. That's makes you the remarkable uh, aspect of the theorem. In fact, it's some kind of universal extension of all these line bundles. And you get some, by tilting, you get some equivalence between, between this triangulated category and the derived category of some associative algebra. And um, this equivalence also matches the abelian subcategory obtained by intersecting with the coherent shifts to uh, the, the category of modules 
the abelian category of modules inside here. So the, the natural heart of the T structure. The, the, sorry, the heart of the natural T structure. So you have this. Um, you can by applying their, their results to the, to the setup. And moreover, what happens next is by uh, uh, there are further results of Kalk and Karmazin, uh, you know, Kar Karmazin, Karmazin, sorry, um, which prove that this associative algebra you get is actually it's an Auslander algebra. So it's something has a very, very explicit construction. And it looks very close to a pre-projective algebra, but it's not a pre-projective algebra. So what you get here is something, they, uh, uh, it's the algebra of a quiver with relations. The quiver is exactly the double of an F, uh, sorry, the double of a finite Dinkin quiver with K plus one nodes. Um, so the, but the relations that you impose are exactly the same as the relations of the, of the pre-projective algebra, except for, for getting the relation at zero. It's, it's, a, it's a very important aspect. Um, it's not the same algebra, so you get something that I'm, I, I learned, it's called uh, Auslander algebra, um, by forgetting the relation at zero. And that's a very important, um, very important uh, aspect because this algebra you're getting here has finite homological dimension. The category has finite, it has homological dimension too. Whereas for the, if it were pre-projective algebra, it would be infinite. So this is an important distinction. Um, so that's what you get in this context. I should say that the reason you get this is because these simple objects, one, zero, up to k, among this collection of simple objects, geometrically zero is associated to a line bundle, to the trivial line bundle, whereas one to k is asso are associated to these divisors that make up the chain. So these are torsion sheaves supported on divisors, whereas this is the line bundle. So that's what singles out zero in this context. Any case, so applying this theorem to our, to our setup, what you learn but the, the thing is that in our setup, however, we forget zero because we, we're only interested in, interested in torsion sheaves, uh, whose Jordan Holder filtration, semi stable torsion sheaves, will only contain factors associated to, the, to vertices one to k. So when you forget zero, you really get a smaller, you really get the pre projective algebra only of the smaller quiver with zero deleted. And that provides the relation between. Um, this moduli, the moduli stack associated to each chain. But then the conclusion is that the moduli stack of, uh, of associated to a chain of divisors ends up being isomorphic to the, rep, to the moduli stack of representations of this uh, pre-projective algebra. And, um, and that this equivalence, again, propagates to the level of cohomological whole algebras. Um, again, you can even check, check it by hand or, or the way my uh, collaborators did by using the machinery of derived algebraic geometry. Um, and they convinced, they proved that this is actually, um, uh, they, they get an isomorphism between homological whole algebra. So in other words, it, the factor associated to each chain ends up being a, a homological, uh, ends up being the positive part of some Youngian associated to an SL algebra. And that's pretty much, pretty much all I had to say, this is the, Conclusion: The conclusion is that we, yes, we get a very explicit presentation of, of the of homological whole algebra of, of semi-stable objects, which propagates from geometry to quivers using the right Mercury correspondence. And I think I'll stop here. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, are there any questions? Uh, yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, Zongzhu. Yeah. Okay, uh, so here you uh, dealt using the um, Akai correspondence from this uh, type A quiver. Well, yes, so I have two this? tilts in this quant. The first tilt was Mokai correspondence, yes. The, uh -huh. the, the first time that it occurred was, yes, it was, uh, let me find the right, yeah, here, mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. So you, you, have, you have the quiver side of the story, you also have the geometry side. Yes, so this is the canonical resolution of the A and singularity, and this is mm -hmm. the associated pre-projective algebra. So it's the pre-projective algebra of the affine thinking quiver, the associated affine thinking quiver. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, for for other type of simple list case, other than A, A D E, but how the D and the E, uh, how how different the argument here can be? Um, no, I think this. 
I think this still works. I mean, there is still a tilting factor. I think yeah, that that's what I expect that should be at least uh, yes, working the tilting for factor, the Yes, the tilting factor works. Um, it does yield, I think it also gives you a, an isomorphism of hearts of these structures. Mm -hmm. um, but, but those chains, the uh, description of the positive that's roots. That's going to be different, yeah. So that's going to be it, quite a different. So. When you start I, I, uh, you know, investigating the structure of, um, you're right, the, the structure of semi-stable objects and, and, the, and the stable objects and the semi-stable objects, I expect some differences, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, and, and it's going to be very important because in that case you get a, you get a special uh, exceptional curve, one special curve that intersects uh, three others instead of two others. That's why you have a and that, that's going to give you some complications when you analyze the, the, the structure of semi-stable sheaves, yeah. Okay. And yeah, also you mentioned question. that the, the stable uh, shifts uh, corresponding one-to-one -one correspondence to the positive roots. And yeah. the depend, that should be depending on this, your choice of uh, omega and uh, uh, mu. There's on, um, on the geometry side of the stability condition and also on the quiver side of the um, yeah, yeah, so let me, maybe I, I went maybe too fast here. So what's happening is that um, for a fixed omega and for a fixed slope, you mm -hmm. get the set of um, isomorphism classes of, of stable sheaves. It's some, sub, some subset of, of the positive roots. But which subset uh -huh. is, of course, which subset is, of course, depend, depends on omega okay. and mu. Yeah. So here my question is that uh, I remember was uh, who, who made the conjecture that uh, there exists one of the conditions so that uh, the stable ones are exactly the indecomposable ones. That means exactly those uh, positive roots. So is that some kind of a generic stable con condition? No, but, it, but it's for quivers, not for pre-projective algebra. This uh -huh. conjecture you mentioned. Okay. Oh, there is a conjecture. Oh, maybe, maybe I just didn't even know uh, which conjecture. I'm sorry. Uh, can you, could you could you repeat the conjecture? Uh, basically, uh, that for quiver there exists stability for which set of stables the same as set of indecomposable. Ah, ah, I see. Yeah, no, I, I'm not sure if it's connected. This is, yeah, these are for pre-projective pre algebras. Yeah, these are um, related to stable objects of pre-projective algebras. Yeah, and, and, yeah. and you work only with one slope, yeah, with slope zero. Fixed slope. Yeah. Well, I mean, on the on the on the pre-projective side is slope zero, but that's not a restriction because you can always shift the king stability parameters. No, to but it's zero. not the whole. Uh, uh, I mean, the whole cohomological whole algebra for the. No, region. it's much smaller. That's the point. Yeah, it's it's much yeah. smaller because it's yes yeah, important. That it's important that it's fixed slope because otherwise you cannot construct a cohomological whole algebra, semi-stable object. Yeah, I, I, I have sort of a you know, question which might be related, maybe not. Uh, so you consider a kind of a, a Calabi-Yau surface with, uh, with a chain of, uh, with a divisor, yeah, with a chain of this. Well, yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. And you consider a category sort of coherent shifts supported on, on this divisor. It's a two Calabi-Yau category. Yeah? Sure, yes, yes. Good. Now, uh, uh, so I'm asking you because I you I tried to use this results of Healy and Plug, but for a different situation. When you take, say, projective line and the cotangent bundle, yeah, to it, it's a projective line. And it's, it's, yes, yeah, yeah, uh -huh. great. So it's the question will be about irregular Higgs bundles. Uh, okay. Yeah. Which so you have this two Calabi-Yau surface cotangent bundle, and suppose you have just regular singularity at P1 at one point, like in your work with Tony and and Ron. Yeah, yeah. And so you you make some blow-ups, so you have a collection of curves, and suppose and now you are looking at sort of a dual situation. You look for. Uh, mm, uh, coherent shifts with one dimensional support, but not on the set of exceptional divisors, but on those which intersect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, so suppose I fix a slope like slope zero, <laughs> whatever Higgs bundles of, of slope. Can, can, can I compute cohomological whole algebra by these methods?
Wow, that's a that's a <laughs> it's a very interesting question, but it's not immediately because you see the the curves that you mentioned, the, the curves that actually support the, the spectral sheaves. The spectral sheaves are supported on some configuration of curves that's not like this. It's actually something I wish I could I could draw. But the, um, yeah, you mean the fix fix points? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Experiment. So those curves, you remember what they are? They yeah, are, yeah, 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 yeah. So links. That's a different configuration, and I don't even think that, that this hiller plug theorem applies to that configuration. I mean, I at least not immediately in my mind. No, it's I don't think it applies. But at least you you do have sort of a Hirzebruch surface because you do some blow ups and the compactified. T star of P1. Yeah, you have a Hertzberg surface, yes, and you can construct an exceptional collection. Well, we discussed this a few years ago, but but the problem yeah, was that- I, I forgot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no, but we weren't getting, yeah, we even tried, we, we tried for a while, but we weren't getting, we, the quivers we were getting for those, from, from those exceptional collections weren't, um, weren't pre-projective algebras. So weren't, you weren't getting Calabria two categories. Uh, okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. Now I recall. Yeah. Because, yeah, because the the real surface is not certainly not colobial, colobial. So, you get some, you get the information you want, but it's packaged in a in a in a, in a, in a not in a good way. <laughs> um, so, but actually, we had a. I remember having a discussion. Actually, when when Alex visited Rutgers, um, we had some discussion about this issue. And uh, that was again uh, two years ago, and uh, we we convinced ourselves that if you take the x one quivers of those Togus invariant curves, what you get is the is one of Hiroya's. You get Hiroya's quiver for the corresponding. Um, you know what I mean. You know better than me what I mean. Uh, maybe he does. Uh, yeah, no, I see you know. about Hiroya, you know, the, those quivers yeah. associated to irregular flat connections. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. so yeah, if in our case, if you take the X1 quiver of the those torus invariant curves that are all tangent to each other, mm -hmm. by taking those, if you take those quivers, you get Hiroya's quivers for the corresponding flat connections through non abelian Hodge correspondence. Okay, okay, okay. So, so if you take just the X1 quiver, you only see Higgs bundles that are such that the underlying vector bundle is trivial. Yes, and this is part of the assumptions in, in Heroist. Right, yeah. so you only get that from the X1 quiver of the, of the tangent of this. Uh, okay. Um, anyway, it's too probably too technical for the rest of the people. Yeah. Are there any other questions? Okay. Uh, no. Okay. If not, then thank you very much for for, for the thank very you. interesting talk. Thank you. Yeah.